baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. God said to Noah, you got 120 days to get the world evangelized. And he made a statement that my spirit would not always strive with man. God's spirit broods over us, broods over us to draw us out of darkness into light. Here is a world, a whole world now, every generation, every young person, God destroyed them all but eight souls. Why did he do that? You got it there now? All right. You got this mic? Okay. I, I want you to just read these words. This is God's looking on the world and what he thought about it at that time. Yeah. Huh? Okay. I'll give you the essence of what I want to work on his face with. He said, he looked down upon the earth, and he saw that man's imagination was upon the evil continually. Man, through the imagination of his own heart and mind, actually, God cut him off. The reason I want you to see this is that God gave an example, that he gave them a paradise to live in to begin with. They were disobedient to his voice. They wound up living under the sweat of their brow. But Noah's age was their mind was upon the evil continually. I want to talk to you today about your mind and your thoughts. Now, Father, help us to bless these young people. Thank you for each one of them. Plant deep in their heart a desire and a hunger and a reaching for the Holy Ghost. Speak to us in a special way, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I have been blessed with the preaching that's been here. It's really been good in the camp meeting. It was excellent. I tell you, we are a privileged people. God has been so good to us. The thing that I suppose that you look at this youth camp and you think, well, it just kind of happened. Uh, Brother Claiborne and, and the whole board, of, and then, of course, workers, you've got probably over a hundred workers here. And I have marveled about that while I've been here. Look at these adults, really trying to do something to help you to feel good. Give them all a big hand. They've been a blessing to you. I, I really appreciate them. They have a very busy department in working with our young people. And going back to my thought here, uh, that whole world at that time was wiped out. And you can see very clearly the reason their mind had become contaminated, and it was upon the evil continually, they were unredeemable. Unredeemable. God could not save them because of their mind being so corrupted. Noah and his family were the only ones living that had not destroyed their walk with God by immorality. The whole earth is corrupted now. And there is, uh, you might look on the sea and think, God, it looks like you're losing the battle. You wipe them all out but eight. Then those eight begins to add on to it. And finally, the law did not make man righteous because his mind is on evil too much. In fact, it would take a miracle to change 
under the old law if you had any kind of problem in that direction. But Calvary brought something that could never happen before Calvary. We, we read of healings before Calvary. He didn't need to go to Calvary for healing. Miracles galore. He didn't need to go to Calvary to see miracles. You can go right down the line on all the spectacular manifestations you want to go into. But before Calvary, he did them all. But he limited himself. When he said, I must need go through Samaria, I must need go to Calvary. In other words, he arrived on the scene, he was a witness to one person, and he became a sacrifice for all persons. He'll fit your need no matter what it is. But I want you to see that Calvary did something that could not ever be done without Calvary. You see... He even said, come unto me, and, he, and if you're weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And you can get that before Calvary. He asked those that were hungry, he could feed them. But their mind was on the physical manifestations. When he saw the fish broken and the bread broken and all those folks ate, it was a big, huge crowd. It should have a, perhaps made an impression different than what it did. The Lord was, just a few hours later, they misinterpreted what he did when he broke the bread. They said, Lord, we have nothing to eat here. He said, do you remember the fishes and the loaves? You see, there are some things that God's trying to get across to you, but your mind is a blocker. The way you feel and think blocks it. Now, you can't be, you can't be listening to everybody else's situations and solve yours. The idea of putting a person on a couch and let him talk about his past, the past is what brought me where I am. I want a future. I want more than just what, what they may find. But Jesus had to go to Calvary so he could become not just with you, but to be in you. You could never get the Holy Ghost before Calvary. Calvary brought you free from your sins from day one to now. When you're baptized in Jesus' name, Calvary brought a continual cleansing that if you fail, you could still go back to the Master and He could forgive you, wash you, clean you up. There are several things that I feel that's important for you today. One of them is the 19th chapter of Psalms. It says that presumption is the great sin. Brother Cole told me that one day, and I, it shocked me. I thought, well, h- how do you come by that? The Scripture said it's a great sin. Here it is. Presumption is the most powerful evil to rule anybody's mind because you presume on God and you presume upon other folks. And that's called a great sin. I can look at it in many directions. I've seen some folks say, one time a lady comes to our door, she's Jehovah's Witness, and we was talking to her, and finally I got on the subject of hell. She said, I don't want to believe that. But I'm here to explain to you, there's something about Jesus Christ who'll give you the opportunity, but if your mind can't handle it, your thoughts can't handle it, he'll just pass on by and let you travel that road alone a few times. Maybe you might wake up to this. I'm here to express to you, it's God's will. He desires to be with you. He wants to make something out of your life. But listen, above all, he wants to communicate to you. Young people, he's trying to get his message into your heart, into your life. Don't you think for one moment it's just for the pulpit. No, 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 no. It's for everybody. It's for you. It's for him. You have to get your eyes off of yourself. You get your eyes on the presence of God and the touch of God. <clears throat> we could have had all the other things I spoke of and not have Calvary. But you can't have the Holy Ghost without Calvary. You can't have a membership in the United Pentecostal Church unless you've been to Calvary. But most of all, you can't belong to His church if you haven't been to Calvary. What was Calvary like? Well, I tell you what. My Lord came to this earth. He subjected Himself to the rules of the world that we He's living in just like you did. At 12 years of age, He astonished all the rulers and their teachers and so on. 
But when his mom and dad arrived, he said he went home with them and he subjected himself to his parents until he was 30. You can't wait to get 18. But listen to me now. Sometimes you balk at your, at your parents. But I'm here to express to you, if you're going to count anything in the kingdom of God, you've got to be submissive to the authority that's over you. You don't talk back. You don't smart off. You don't go out there and slam a door. Young people, if God gave you some parents as good parents, you ought to pray for them every single day of your life. That's the making of it. The way you think of your parents is expressed in the way you say things. Thoughts that's in your mind become action with your tongue. Sometimes folks, and I, I, I say, well, we used to call it Fool's Hill. When you got to that age that you made a fool of yourself. That's what we always called it, but I don't know what they call it today. But getting you past that, that carnal level to where you don't lose your spiritual walk with God. If you disagree with your pastor, your parents, or, or the, uh, any authority, there's a way to approach them. You must learn how to do that. Now, where does it all begin? It begins in your idea of thoughts. Thoughts. <clears throat> I've been on jobs where guys would sit and talk and run down the contractor, run down all the faults of this job that they were on and so forth. And when you get through eating lunch, you don't feel like working. One young man got so upset one time that he walked off the job and went home and quit. But it was all negative, negative, negative. You know, sometimes people don't realize that when you keep talking that way, it makes you like that. And what you feel from that person is to tear everything down. Now, this thing can happen right here in this youth camp. I don't like this, don't like the other. Well, I'll tell you what, it's a better being in a hospital than I know of. When you, when you have a spiritual understanding and spiritual thoughts, you act spiritual. So that's the last step you take if you act upon what you're thinking about. It gets down deep inside of you. And, of course, sometimes we think, I can think that, but I'll try to do this and so forth. You need to have the Lord to help you to even ask for forgiveness for the thoughts of my heart. Old Simon come up and wanted to buy the Holy Ghost gift, and Simon Peter told him, he said, you don't have no part in a lot of this. He mentioned that you're in the gall of bitterness. He began to travel down the road of what was in him, and he began to say, please pray for me. I'm expressing something to you. If anything you're going to be a, a hypocrite on, you don't want to be a hypocrite on Jesus Christ. If anything's going to make you, make you lose your soul, don't let it be in that area. But make up your mind, I don't have to live with a carnal, selfish attitude. Selfishness destroys friendships, homes, churches. It's the strongest. Well, Brother A.D. Urson said, more Christians are going to go to hell through their selfishness than any other sin. And I, I've analyzed it, and I can't, I can't refute it. You can be in the spirit in a service like last night, and you can turn about today and be as carnal as all get out. Where is it controlled? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I've been with young people in Bible college and also in the church and that kind of thing. And uh, I, I, I'm going to go down the line on a few of these points. Because I feel like that it, it relates to your age and even to mine even now. But did you ever stop to think what envy and jealousy does. Now, you don't have to say anything. You, just, you all be quiet so I get through with this because I, I don't want to identify you, but everybody has it in them. We're born with it. You get in a group like this and you're, you're trying to win some young man and he's out to win some young lady and here comes a, another person around running them down. We do those things sometimes, don't, even, don't get it much thought. But I'm expressing to you today, if you don't keep your mind spiritual, and that doesn't mean that thoughts can't go through your head, but if you don't get a spiritual mind, you're going to find yourself thinking on the evil continually. And where presumptions comes in, 
is that you judge not on facts, but you judge on how you feel about that person. And you make things that happen, you make them become facts that are not facts to prove your point. Jealousy is bound up in our lives. That baby has it. When he gets old enough to distinguish between mom and dad and somebody outside the church, and that mom comes up with another baby and his mother picks it up, you see the jealousy begin to rise. So it's deep inside. How do you know you have jealousy? The person that you're jealous of, if something good happens, you feel so bad about it. But you can smile and shake their hand and say some sweet things. You know you're a hypocrite because you don't really mean it in your heart. But if something happens real bad to them, you can go along and just say, oh, but in your heart, you say, yes, Lord, just half kill them. Do something bad to them. Pray against them. But if we survive this age we're living in now, right now, almost to 2000, you young people have got to catch on to what I'm going to tell you here next. You can't fill your mind with the pornography. You can't fill your mind with television, with the movies. A lot of the rotten videos out of these video stores. You cannot do that. You've got to realize, I live or fall on my own thoughts. I don't even blame the devil for that. You have to have a desire to live for God. And you've got to have enough desire that you can crucify your flesh. I have... I'm not a newspaper reader. I'm a scanner. They're lying about something when they tell me, so I don't know who when they're lying telling the truth. So I just kind of scan the newspaper. Did you ever stop to see this era of time in our country to where more people are being tore apart, tore down? Any politician goes into the political world today, he better have a clean slate. So there's a bunch of vultures there to dig up all that trash. I'm so glad we come to Jesus Christ. He doesn't dig it up. It's under the blood. He set me free. Now my mind is clean. My mind is pure. He makes a difference. When you presume about a person, you'll say some things that's really bad because he's not there and she's not there to defend themselves. And sometimes we're eager to carry bad news more than we are good news. But I'm telling you, in the church, young people, you are a key. I've never seen any revival that didn't start with young people. That's right. And I'm telling you now, your thought life, your walk with God, your body is a sacred instrument of God. You don't let someone defile that body. The devil wants the body. He doesn't care anything about you. He can get your body. He'll send you. To, you'll go to hell. But here's what I want you to recognize. You have to see this body belongs to him. If I abuse it, he'll destroy me. Get your thought life right. Don't think, well, he wouldn't do this. I've seen some of those that's gone the other direction. They say, oh, God's too loving to have a hell. Well, when you're there, you tell me what it looks like. You got to understand, we need to get our mind trained and geared with the Word of God. I don't want no guilt trips. I feel like when God convicts me of something, just fix it now. I don't want to live in a guilt trip. I don't want to feel like I'm, I'm just, a, just a sinner, uh, just a hypocrite. No, I can't handle that kind of guilt. It bothers me too much. But if you learn to know He loves you, He walks with you, He talks with you, He dwells in you, I want you to wake up and realize... He's not just at youth camp. He's not just a Sunday night service. He's God all day long. Monday through Sunday. And that's what I want you to see. You've got to train your mind to be able to deal with this world around you. And that's why when you come home, you feel like you need a Holy Ghost bath. You've been around people cursing and using the Lord's name as a curse. You see, all of those things have got to be washed out of your mind. God cleanse my mind. I don't want to think about that. My nature loves to think on that line, but I'm crucifying my nature. I've got to be clean and pure. You help me to serve you, Jesus. I'm not going to let the devil pull me aside. The world is using God's name, Jesus, 
and don't even know who he is. Don't even know why they do it. I said to the man I was working with some years ago, and, and he was just cursing, using the most foul language. I said, Earl, why don't you use my name a while? He stopped. He said, huh? Well, you've been running down the name of Jesus for the longest here. Use mine a while. He said, you know, I didn't even know I was doing it. He didn't know he was even saying it. He had expressed himself in such a curse word way that he couldn't describe anything without using a bunch of vulgar language to describe it. Because that was all in his mind. Out of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Oh, I want you to see that if you seek his face and you're hungry and thirsty after him, you'll discover, you'll enjoy the walk and the talk. There are some people, this is like an abused wife and the husband beats her up. Some people can't live in a church unless you beat them up ever so often. You've got to get beat up, beat up. Hey, well, I'll tell you what. Jesus doesn't beat you up. He saves you from yourself. You're the one He's trying to save. When you get your thoughts right, you act different. You, 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 just, you act different. Back in the crash of 29, there was people that lost in the stock market, jumping out of windows, plugging up all the cracks in the house and turning the gas on. They couldn't stand the crash. They committed suicide, many of them. But I want you to know something. As far as I'm concerned, this church should not depend upon financial gain or, or good economy in serving God. When there's no figs on the tree, no grapes on the vine, no sheep in the field, and everything's gone haywire. Habakkuk said, but we will still love and worship and praise the living God. Job said, the Lord gave, the Lord took away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I want to tell you, you get your mind on how God tells you to get your thinking going, and you'll overcome it much quicker. Because you understand, this is only going to be for a little while. And you need to enjoy those bad places because you'll testify about it from now on. Thinking while I'm preaching. You're forming thoughts about what you hear. You're forming a feeling about what you hear. And just as this Brother Hyder was preaching here, and he was full of the zeal of the Lord. What does it make you do? It makes you get out of the ordinary. You're thinking, your mind, you feel God is in this. God's helping me with this. He's speaking to me. Give me words. You see, the Lord said one place, I'll put my words in your mouth, not in your thoughts. Many times I've preached and I said, Why, where did I get that? Where did that come from? But the Holy Ghost knows what we all have need of. And while you're preaching as fast as we are, we have said a lot of things that we didn't think about before the service. All of these things I'm bringing to you are, are your own personal relationships with Jesus Christ. You ought to enjoy it to the hilt. You can play baseball. These other little games, if you don't go to the world and do it like they do it. I had more fun watching those ladies out there last night than, than any World Series. This world is selling their soul to the spirit of sports. We get so much of that junk until you're tired. Your newspaper's got to be full of it. They exalt the rock people. They exalt the movie stars. They exalt all of this. It's time for the church to realize we don't have no interest in that whatever. Amen. Now, you should live for God. You've got the Holy Ghost power from God to live for God. Noah's day, only eight souls. You talk about feeling rejected. They must have felt rejected. Eight souls. That's all. When the ark landed and they walked out on that muddy ground, don't you know that was a feeling, the loneliness, the whole world is on the water, everything's gone? But he didn't forget God. He built an altar. When you do the things that make God pleased with you, God will always lead you and guide you and direct you. <clears throat> I've got to go back on something here that, that I'm just trying to hit here and there. 
Jealousy and envy has caused more trouble in the church that I've had over the years in my ministry than any other sin. Presumption plagues all of us when you're angry, you're upset, and you'll call people names, and you'll go around and get your friends to join you with your side of that story, so you look good and they look bad. Now, you have to, I hope I can get you to grasp it. If you can't live this personally and live it in your home, your shouting means nothing. I'd like to see all the miracle gifts you can see. But when I begin to understand that miracles didn't change the world when Jesus healed them by the multitude, it was Calvary, where he could cleanse all your sins and he could dwell in you, in you. He ought to be able to talk to you. When you read the Word of God, say, Lord, open my understanding. And in the congregation... It's very easy. I can pick out two or three situations. There were some ladies in the church got jealous of my wife. And she didn't know what was going on. And uh, one of them said, well, they first opened up their little case and said, uh, I want you to help me to pray for Sister Price. And she began to tell all the things she thought was wrong. And the other lady agreed with her. And said, we don't know what's going on. I mean, they do all that behind your back. And... Uh, she was so tied up in us with, with, with our life that she had to have everything we had. I only went to the house one time that, that I can remember, and the whole front room looked, my, looked like my front room. And we bought pieces of furniture in those days that didn't even match. They were made to sit on, not look at. She had bought the same stuff. She had a little girl that's about the age of my little girl. And I'm telling you, she kept those curls on and she fancied up. Her whole time she was competing with us. I had a white Samoa dog. And lo and behold, I looked in the backyard. He came to the door of this white Samoa dog in her yard. I said, you got a dog just like mine. I hadn't gone on me what was going on. That woman was so miserable. I wondered why she came up front every so often and so many months apart. And she said, Brother Price, pray for me. I've got a jealous spirit. You've got to get rid of it. Jesus wants you to love with feeling of affection, not lip service. What happened to this family has been sad. They're miserable. So one of the other ladies have been in the little conversation, you know, counting themselves praying when they were there complaining. And uh, she come to my wife and said, you know, this other lady has really had a hard time. She's, she's really jealous of you. And my wife looked right in the eye. He said, I think you are too, aren't you? She could have swallowed her false teeth. But she, she finally said, yes, I, I guess I am. You've got to make sure the person that you take close to you has got a level head, clean heart. I don't care how much they can play ball with you. That's not going to get you to heaven, friend. What is preaching? Paul said, preach the word in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. Does that sound like preaching? If you're not doing that, and all long-suffering and doctrine. If you're not doing some of those four things, you're not preaching, you're talking. I don't think you've got what I'm trying to get across on that one. But what I'm trying to tell you... If you are so sensitive and so easy to get your feelings hurt, and you go around with an offended attitude, I want you to know you need Jesus more than anything in this world. We've got to get some quality character in our lives to survive the day we're living in. Well, let's praise Him for it. Some months ago, and it still brings in my heart, the Lord spoke to me that if you want to get close to me, he said, you'll have to handle rejection. Now, get off your guilt trip. I, I don't look as pretty or handsome. I don't have money. Would you stop and think about what you do have? 
and not what you don't have? You're going to have to go through some things in this life as contrary to this world if you make it to heaven. So make up your mind. I'm living for God. I'm living for Jesus. I'm going to serve with all my heart. With all my mind. With all my soul. I'm going to be corrected. I've had parents. When you touch their kids, they get as carnal as though they didn't have the Holy Ghost. You just touch one of these kids. And the kids know they've got them all worried about them. And so what they make up their mind to do is play that back against the preacher and so forth. And I want you to know if you're parents, there's some here, but if you, when you become a parent, I want you to live where you love your wife, you love the husband, you love your children. Don't give me that, that attitude of mumbling and grumbling and fussing and quarreling and fighting. That's not the Holy Ghost. That's through your nature. That's what you was born with. That's who you are. I, I, want to, I want to balance in this thing. I want to balance in this thing. Your spirituality is not manifest in a good service, per se. I'm not doing away with all of that. But I'm trying to tell you, when you get your walk with God right on the outside, and you keep walking with the Lord, learning of Him, if you make a mistake, don't quit. If you fail somewhere, don't stop. And th- look, we've got to get off this guilt trip of just living with a guilt. You come back and get your heart clean, get your mind clean, get your spirit clean. The Holy Ghost will help you to live for God, and you'll become a strong leader in your home. <clears throat> One of those movie stars, and I'm, I don't know where I could call her name or not, but anyway, she's in the Ozark. And she said that her daddy would never let him go to a movie. He wouldn't let him cut the hair of the girl. She said there was a movie made of the Ozarks down there where they lived, and when it come to town, she begged her dad to let, let him go to the movie. He said, he said, okay, he let him go. This is what she said. She said, I wish he hadn't, because I lost confidence and faith that I could change him. Young people, don't argue with your parents about this walk with God. You know, Jesus at 30, from the... Experience that he had in Jerusalem at 12, he was able to confound all the teachers there of what he under, what he knew. But he went back home with Mary and Joseph, was submissive to them until he's 30. His custom was to go to the synagogue every Sabbath. That was his custom. Now he looks at the Sanhedrin. All those teachers that were so great in Judaism. Here's the God that gave the law. Here's the God that knows more than any of them know. But he submitted himself to them. Now your circumstance at home, if it's an abusive situation, you need to get in touch with the right people in that. But I'm trying to tell you, as a person living for God individually, you can make up your mind. You can carry it with you. You can walk with God, and God will strengthen He'll help you. And your mind will become more clean and pure. Your mind is get disturbed because you put thoughts in here that stirs you up. <clears throat> My interest is in this age group and, and younger. I believe the generation we've got coming on among your generation... And the young children below your generation, I believe we're going to get some of the greatest teachers and, live, and, and, and preachers we've ever had. We're going to have some of the greatest mothers and dads we've, that we've ever had. Because we have to do it if we survive. I believe that God is going to raise up in the last day the kind of apostolic life that's going to excite every one of you. There's a beauty in what Jesus does and what you suffer for the name of Christ. They said, rejoice. We'll discover how to do that. But I'm I'm looking to realize that this gospel is going to be flourishing to the day of the rapture. Somebody get the Holy Ghost five minutes before the rapture. This church is here to stay. But I want to be in this church. I want to be a part of this church. I want to learn how to love one another. Care for one another. I want to feel in my spirit we're all one. What I like about what I see, 
We are a multicultural people. God isn't going to save your culture. He isn't going to save your language. I don't care what you are. We're made one in Christ Jesus. We're made one in Christ Jesus. Culture is carnal. Our carnality is carnal. Jesus made a church that he could unite all kinds of people from the isles of the sea to every continent on the earth and make it one church, and that church is going to love each other. Please, hear what I'm telling you. Quit looking on as the world sees these folks. You say, that's my brother, that's my sister. We are in one church, one God, one heaven, and we're going there. Don't ever get the idea of fight for your culture. God hates that. Now, let me explain that. You belong to a different country now. You belong to a heavenly country. And you've got to get a heavenly culture. I use this illustration all the time. If it's possible that our hearts could lay out here on this altar, you wouldn't know who was who and what was what. Let's be one heart, one mind, one accord. Let's don't build in our imagination things that's not really true about each other. I feel like God gave us this in our district. I've had a burden for it the last few years. We're seeing revival all over the state. Let me tell you what. There's people that never heard the name of Jesus are in our churches today. They were brought overseas from the wars that's all around about us. I'm here to tell you, you've got the best thing the world could ever have is an apostolic church. A church that preaches the word, the truth. Let's quit blaming problems on other people. As long as you're going to blame somebody else, you can't be helped. You can't be helped at all. But with the right attitude and the right spirit, I'll tell you what you can be. You can be an example. And God will teach you His ways. Show you His path. Now, it's in the heart of every one of you of choosing a mate for life. You're at that age that that's got to be in your mind thinking about it. But uh, making that choice is most important. I've, had, I've married people that they loved each other one day. They said they did. I made them make vows that they did. And then later on, they let their troubles get to them. Before they were married, she could ask all kinds of questions about everything. And she was so interested in the Bible because you were and uh, so on. You thought, boy, this girl really thinks I'm smart. Then when you get married and he starts asking those questions, it's no longer like it was. It sounds like to him, yeah, 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 yeah. In other words, it's how you thought about it. When you was trying to win her, you was almost bound down and putting your coat in the puddle. Let her walk across. But after that time, get those cold feet off to me. I don't want to be that close to you. You need some wisdom from God to know what to choose and how to choose them. I've had several young people, boy, they tell me how bad each other are. I said, you know what? You picked them out. I didn't. Now, it shouldn't be that way. Two Holy Ghost filled people should not divorce. You need to pray that God can save you. It has to be that way. Oh, it's 1045. I'm at the end. I just want to tell you one more point. I'm seeing families in my church, after I've been preaching on knowing Jesus Christ, that took the attitude. This one case, I just give you the top of the story. She said, Lord, you've got to change me. I've got to get your nature. And they've been in the church for seven and a half, eight years, I guess. And they just fought like cats and dogs. But she made up her mind. She went to prayer. She told me, she said, you know, Brother Price... I'm going to fast and pray till God changes me. I thought to myself, oh, woman, we'll bury you. Uh, I've never seen her like this. But I'll tell you what, in a few days she called me back and she was rejoicing because God began to show her herself. She saw herself. Instead of her blaming, trying to change him, she changed herself and let him be what he was. Well, you know, before it was all over, he's down at the altar. He's praying through. I tell you, if, if you show love... To the unlovable, 
If you show kindness to those folks who don't know what it's all about, the beautiful thing about this one case was it has worked for months now since that day. She said, I may have to go in the bathroom and cry and pray God give me grace because I want to say something. She could out talk him. She could out think him. She could maneuver him. She could, she could hide stuff from him. He wouldn't know it. And she knew how to press the button. But when Jesus changed her, he couldn't understand it. I'm telling you, you better change or die. Because God isn't going to put up with that until you change. Well, God bless you. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, Resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful.